Hello, I am author Lucy Holland. I wrote Sister Song and most recently Song of the Huntress, um, which is a, both of them are historical fantasy novels uh, set in the early medieval period. Today I'm going to be taking you uh, on a deep dive of the mythology behind my novel uh, Song of the Huntress. Song of the Huntress is inspired by the wild hunt myth. There are many incarnations of this myth. Um, the one that I have chosen to follow is basically about a, a leader, a king, uh, a queen of their of their war, the mortal realm, making a deal with uh, a supernatural being, um, going to this supernatural world, spending what they believe to be only a few days there, um, and returning to find that actually 300 years have passed in the mortal realm, that everyone they love, everything they fought for, if all of that is gone, uh, and that they find themselves cursed to ride eternally, to, to lead the hunt, which is, um, you know, usually it's, it's hunting down humans foolish enough to be out of doors at night. Um, so it's, it's a pretty dark story, uh, and I thought that it would be a really fun, it, it provided a really great premise for uh, exploring how it would feel to be the leader of, of a, a supernatural hunt. So we're familiar with uh, the idea of curses as a Faustian bargain. Um, you know, the, the person who is cursed somehow brings this curse upon themselves. Um, but the British, uh, the British version, the ancient British version of the Wild Hunt myth is a little bit different. Um, there's a sense that uh, the king of fairy, who is the sort of the baddie in this, as it were, um, he is, you know, ultimately a trickster. Um, and the punishment uh, given to Hurler in this case, or the leader of the Wild Hunt, which is to ride eternally, um, it's not only unmerited, uh, but it's also uncourted to some extent. And I found that really fascinating fact that it's, it seems, if, you, if you're familiar with the, the British version of this myth, it seems unfair in the extreme what happens to the main character, this, this Hurler figure. Um, and I thought, I want to write a story about this. I want to know exactly what it would feel like to be tricked in that way, to return to a world which had forgotten you, um, and to feel like your freedom and your very voice uh, were taken away. The Wild Hunt is a, a very prevalent folkloric motif. Um, it's so prevalent, it's recorded in the, uh, if I'm going to pronounce this right, the Arne Thompson Uther Index, which is a vast index of folk tales, um, because obviously the same stories crop up in many different countries. And the Wild Hunt myth, for example, I mean, there is uh, a version of it, incarnation of it in, you know, Germanic myth, Slavic myth, uh, Italian, Slovene, French, and, you know, many, many others. So it is a very, very popular motif. Um, I chose to focus on the, the British uh, incarnation of this myth, obviously, because I'm very interested in British folklore. Um, and, and this story led me to this, this um, mythological figure, Gwyn ap Neith, who appears in, he's, he's a, a, a central part of Welsh mythology. Um, he's a psychopomp, so he's a figure associated with guiding souls or spirits to an other world or an afterlife. Um, another state of being, basically. He appears in several Welsh texts, um, some old poems. Uh, he's a key figure in the Celtic mythological space. Um, and he's associated with Arnun, which is the Welsh other world, which is kind of equivalent to Irish Tin Anog. Uh, it's also the place where, you know, they some pagans believe that our souls go after we die. Um, and that, that's the, the, that is the version I, I really wanted to explore because this character, Gwyn, is so, he's so fascinating and he plays such an important role in, in actually many neo-pagans' uh, lives today. Um, of course, you know, my decision to make her a female, uh, to have her lead a band of female warriors is a little nod to the Valkyries of North mythology as well, um, of course. They were all women, and they're famous for leading off souls to the other world. So, um, but you know, like like I, I've said with my, my previous work, uh, I like to just change. You know, I like to take a myth that everyone thinks they knows they know well and change it up a little bit. So I have plenty of real people uh, in the story, not just mythological people, um, historical figures too. 
Uh, I like to root my retellings in historical time frames. Um, so obviously my two main characters, I have three main characters, but two of them are a king and a queen, Ein and Athelberg, and they were early 8th century monarchs of Wessex, uh, which is the kingdom that eventually became the Kingdom of England. Um, I also have a bunch of figures from the church, the early church, uh, like St Boniface, uh, who is the patron saint of Devon. Um, as I've said before, like it's important for me to kind of reseed queer identity uh, into history, which I feel like that's where it's missing from. Um, and doing, being able to balance kind of history and myth, it allows me to look at certain historical situations in different ways. Um, one thing I noticed when I researched uh, the historical lives of what we do know about Ein and Athelberg is that they didn't have any children, um, or at least the, the succession was in doubt. So after, um, after they died, um, the, the, the kingdom of Wessex you know, carried on, obviously, but the rule went to a distant relative, which is very unusual because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is super keen to you know, focus on bloodlines and, you know, they're very keen to trace their, their lineages all the way back to uh, Serdic and Sinric, who are the earliest invaders. So that was a really interesting fact. And I thought, maybe there's a story in there. Maybe there's a story there that is possibly about queer identity that hasn't come down to us um, for, for obvious reasons, is that, you know, both of these people didn't fit naturally into, um, you know, the dominant narrative, the idea of, of what a king and queen should ascribe to be. Uh, so I feel like, you know, my, my work explores, you know, it, it, it restores an identity to them that, you know, I'm not saying that they had, um, but it's just a really nice opportunity to explore in a space, in this sort of mythological historical space. Obviously, I've been talking a little bit about my two, my two other protagonists, the, the real-life historical um, Ein and Athol of Wessex. But of course, my third and you know most important protagonist is Herla, who's obviously an incarnation of King Herla from the Wild Hunt myth. Um, my Herla is the leader of Boudicca's army, so she belongs to the Iceni tribe. Um, she is someone who fell victim to her own pride and ambition. Um, she's not just someone who was unlucky enough to be cursed. As I said before, I was interested in digging a bit further into the whole kind of curse idea and whether she possibly courted this by, be, by overreaching, by being too ambitious and too prideful. Um, I felt like she needed to claim some responsibility for the situation in which she finds herself. Um, I originally, interestingly, had her as the Earl King, um, but the Earl King is another myth entirely and probably deserves its own story. One of my, my things is that I overreach, I try to pull, pull all the myths into one book and I had to decide, no, nope, I shall focus very much on the wild hunt. Um, but the Earl King, I urge anyone to, to look up that myth as well, it's very interesting and it does intersect um, quite well with, with the wild hunt, the Germanic version of the wild hunt. So yeah, you learn a lot uh, when you're researching um, for a book like this. It is, it's quite a big book, it's quite in depth. There's a lot of, uh, I did a lot of historical research um, as well as mythological research. I stumbled across something really amazing, which was the divine, um, divine Celtic concept of sovereignty. And sovereignty is, it's hard to kind of put into words, but generally this idea is, is anthropal, just kind of personified as, as a goddess, um, a maiden, a mother, someone wed to the earth, um, like a personification of nature. Um, and, and that idea of this sort of ineffable being intersected really nicely with the loose magic system that I work with. I'm a big fan of not explaining all of my magic. Uh, I feel like magic is ineffable in some, you know, in some senses, and actually it feels more magical to, to leave a lot of it kind of as a mystery. The magic in Song of the Huntress is a kind of continuation of the magic that I introduced in Sister Song. It's still very much a part of the land. It's about restoring a connection to an earth that we've lost uh, contact with, I feel like. I lost our connection with over the years, with the growth of technology. Um, you know, we demand more and more of the Earth's resources without giving anything back. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping, this is a, a, a very arrogant thing to say, but I'm hoping in some small way to, to re-establish that connection and reawaken people's interest in the idea of, of sovereignty, um, the, you know, the idea of, of 
rekindling um, that that connection that we have with um, you know the places that we came from, the stories that that founded us and and, and shaped us as human beings. Thank you for watching me uh, talk about my book. I really hope that you will feel inspired to pick up Song of the Huntress and give it a read.